no one could have known um, the scale of corruption that was taking place with House Bill 6. I guess, you know, the first word that came to my mind is embarrassing, shameful. Uh, I think we should expect more, ask more of our elected elected representatives and our regulators. Shareholders are supposed to pay for lobbying um, and ratepayers aren't. And of course, no one is supposed to pay for bribes because they're illegal. We should have had an honest conversation about what good energy policy in the state looked like uh, that was totally divorced from a scandal-ridden piece of legislation like House Bill 6. At this point, I think I would be shocked if there's not other folks that get a little dirty from this. Hello everyone, I'm Stephanie Haney and this is Legally Speaking. Today we're looking at what has been called the most elaborate and extensive bribery scandal in the history of Ohio politics. $60 million in bribes paid by First Energy, one of the nation's largest investor-owned electric systems, to influence legislation in Ohio to get their customers to bail out two failing nuclear power plants. And it extends beyond Ohio. As we wait to see what new details come to light in the federal racketeering and conspiracy trial tied to the scheme, today we're shining a light on dark money and explaining the first energy bribery scandal based on what we know from the people who were in office when House Bill 6 was passed, guilty pleas, and what people from First Energy have admitted to in order to avoid criminal charges themselves. In July of 2021, the U.S. Department of Justice came to a deferred prosecution agreement with First Energy. As part of that agreement, First Energy admitted to spending $60 million to influence former Ohio Speaker of the House Larry Householder so that he would help pass a more than $1 billion bailout of two failing nuclear power plants. The Perry Nuclear Power Plant in Perry, Ohio, and the Davis Bessie Nuclear Station in Oak Harbor, both of which were owned by a subsidiary of First Energy called First Energy Solutions. House Bill 6 got those bailouts signed into law, among many other things, on July 23rd, 2019, at least temporarily. But it was a long road to get there, going all the way back to at least 2016. The majority of what became House Bill 6 were two different pieces of legislation. It was the bailout of the Ohio Valley electrical plants called OVAC, which were for two coal plants that were built in the 1950s, one along the Ohio River in the state of Ohio, but one in Indiana, uh, which is one of the reasons why I could never get majority support in the Ohio House. And then there was the House Bill 6 bailout of two nuke plants. In the midst of that, Larry Householder returns to the Ohio House during my second term and begins recruiting candidates to run um, in 2020 in the hopes that he can become speaker, um, probably with the promise to First Energy that what then Speaker Ryan Smith failed to do, get the Zen legislation passed, that you know this would be a top priority for, for uh, Larry Householder if he became speaker. And so First Energy invested an awful lot of money in these competitive Republican primaries and, you know, that's one of the reasons why Larry Householder becomes the speaker. And lo and behold, you know, one of the first things he does is convene, you know, a special committee on energy competitiveness or something like that and begin laying the groundwork for House Bill 6. So House Bill 6, as we know it today, was years in the making. Before we go any further, let's introduce you to the players who finally got it passed. There's First Energy Corporation and its subsidiary, First Energy Solutions, which is now a separate company called Energy Harbor. Two dark money groups, one called Partners for Progress and another called Generation Now. Chuck Jones, the former CEO of First Energy. Mike Dowling, First Energy's former Senior Vice President for External Affairs. We've already mentioned Larry Householder, the former Ohio Speaker of the House. There's also Householder's longtime political staffer, Jeffrey Longstreth. Sam Randazzo, the former chair of the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio, or PUCO. Tony George, a successful and controversial business owner in Northeast Ohio. Matt Borges, a lobbyist and the former chair of the Ohio Republican Party. And Juan Suspedes and the late Neil Clark, both Ohio lobbyists. Among these men and organizations, there have been six federal racketeering and conspiracy indictments. No one could have known um, the scale of corruption that was taking place. Corruption doesn't have any place in our, our government at any level. Um, and was really shocked and, and incredibly disturbed and saddened to see 
with that type of corruption that's taking place. You know, the trial coming up in January will be really interesting. Uh, you know, we don't know what all is going to come out of that. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions about why more indictments haven't happened. Um, there are other folks implicated in this. Uh, so I think it will be really interesting to see kind of what comes out of that uh, trial and, and how things move forward or don't uh, essentially after that. Just remember, this is a conspiracy case. This is a racketeering case. And they have five defendants, one committed suicide, two have already pled guilty, or three have already pled guilty, including First Energy, who admitted to all of their felonious conduct, which is what motivated me to send the Browns a letter saying they should separate themselves from the First Energy uh, sponsorship deal. And they refuse to do that. So, you know, again, this is quite the mess. That death by suicide was lobbyist Neil Clark. He had been indicted, pleaded not guilty, and seven months later was found dead by a self-inflicted gunshot wound to his head near his Florida home. All of this tied to House Bill 6. Here's what we've gathered about how it got passed and how dark money influence made it happen. Former Ohio Representative Kent Smith, now serving in the Ohio Senate, had a hand in stopping the previous bills that would become House Bill 6, but that was before Larry Householder became House Speaker. Anybody can introduce any piece of legislation that can do anything. We are, by definition, lawmakers, and so we can do whatever we want to do, but after that bill is introduced, it goes to the committee called Rules and Reference, and Rules and Reference sends it to one of the 20 or so legislative committees where it'll get its hearings. But yeah, Larry Householder, as the Speaker of the House, is the chairman of Rules and Reference, and he gets to decide where legislation goes. So he becomes Speaker, House Bill 6 get introduced, and they send it to a committee where I'm not a member. After having served in the House before, Householder was elected again in 2016 and became Speaker of the House for the second time in 2017. From there, First Energy executives Chuck Jones and Mike Dowling funneled him money through Partners for Progress and Generation Now. The goal was to help Householder get people elected who can guarantee House Bill 6 would pass. As part of its deferred prosecution agreement, First Energy officials won't have to face a criminal trial. But thanks to a shareholder's lawsuit filed against First Energy, we now know who it was they were dealing with. Well, I've always known that House Bill 6 was a bad bill. And it was clear when they were uh, when they introduced it. It was clear when they advocated for it. It was clear when we were uh, getting um, you know suspicious mailers in our district advocating uh, constituents to call us and pressure us to pass a really bad bill for Ohio. It really hurts our industrial sector. It hurts our consumer sector. It hurts our ability to uh, move our state forward with a sound energy policy. So it's always been a bad bill. I wasn't surprised when Larry Householder got indicted and arrested because it was a bad bill all along. Chuck Jones, who was CEO of First Energy when all of this was happening, was fired in October of 2020. But between 2017 and 2020, he had already earned more than $51 million. As the CEO of a utility company, his performance bonuses would have been based in part on the company's financial performance. Um, so you can see that the extreme lengths that he and others inside the company went to not only to get like this bailout of the nuclear plants in Ohio, but simultaneously they were trying to get additional bailouts for power plants that they had in um, Pennsylvania and lobbying the then Trump administration for a federal bailout through the DOE. So it seemed like any way that they could force either taxpayers or ratepayers to fund <laughs> some sort of massive bailout that had much broader, wider benefit uh, financially than just those power plants. They were pursuing those things very aggressively at the time. When Jones was fired, the board elected not to invoke a provision that would have required him to pay at least some of that money back. Mike Dowling, who has not been charged with the crime at this time, was also fired from First Energy at the same time as Jones. And a shareholder's lawsuit against First Energy calls him the person who devised and orchestrated the bribery scheme. By combining that with the guilty pleas already entered in the upcoming federal racketeering and conspiracy trial against Larry Householder and lobbyist Matt Borges, we know that the $60 million First Energy used to influence Householder was passed through dark money organizations including Generation Now and Partners for Progress. Partners for Progress was a group controlled by First Energy, which was started by then First Energy lobbyist and later aide to Governor Mike DeWine, Dan McCarthy. McCarthy formed Partners for Progress in 2017. 
Weeks after First Energy senior executives traveled with Householder on the First Energy corporate jet to the presidential inauguration of Donald Trump. McCarthy served as its president before resigning to become DeWine's legislative affairs director in early 2019. McCarthy is no longer working for Governor DeWine's administration. The building that Partners for Progress operates out of is owned by business owner Tony George. Now here's the tricky thing about dark money. Dark money can legally be used to influence politics when it's spent by nonprofit organizations that don't have to reveal who their donors are. Dark money groups can legally take in unlimited donations and spend that money on elections without anyone outside of the organization ever knowing where that money came from. It's hard to trace, but the thing is, it does have limits. For starters, politics can't be a dark money organization's main purpose. That's according to the IRS. A sort of unofficial rule here is no more than half of its money can be spent on elections. We also sort of get into this dark money versus bribery, you know, which is to say with Citizens United allowing corporations to engage in political activity and the ability to cover your, your you know, the donor footstep, footsteps, perhaps if Larry Householder just doesn't spend some of this money on fixing his condo in Florida, this is all completely legal. And again, you know, that's where this could be, you know, an indictment of the cash for votes system that unfortunately American democracy may well have become after Citizens United. But the Department of Justice says Generation Now was more like Larry Householder's personal piggy bank, and it is not legal to use dark money to hide bribes. Part of the crime that Householder is accused of committing and will face trial for is using some of the more than $60 million paid into Generation Now by First Energy Solutions to settle a personal lawsuit, pay for a home in Florida, and pay thousands in credit card debt, all in exchange for supporting the billion-dollar bailout of two nuclear power plants. Householder's indictment was announced on July 30th, 2020. He was removed as speaker that same day by a unanimous vote, but his colleagues couldn't completely remove him from the House just yet. We looked at the rules, and the rules say you can remove somebody for a variety of reasons, and, and, and the allegations against him were in that list, um, but you can only do it one time for the same offense. So if we were to have removed him in the 133rd, and we knew he was running unopposed in for, for re-election, that he would just be back in the next DA, and we would not be able to remove him a second time. So we were persuaded to wait and then expected the, the Republicans to, uh, of their own volition, to remove him from office immediately after we started the next General Assembly in 2021, which would be this General Assembly. And that didn't happen. Householder did run for re-election unopposed in 2020 and won. He wasn't removed from the House by his fellow representatives until June 16th, 2021, by a vote of 75 to 21. You know, it befuddled me that nobody was willing to step up and call for this guy to be removed. So I did it. And, and you know, I led the charge. I got the Republicans off their seats. And finally, we got it done. It was a team effort. It was a bipartisan effort. But, you know, until someone had, had you know, the, the, the willingness to step forward and, and really be willing to push the issue forward, no one was going to do it. And, uh, and, you know, that was as much on the Democrats as it was on the Republicans, candidly. Uh, so, so I, this is my last few weeks in the State House, thankfully. <laughs> um, as you can tell, it's been a really uh, excruciating four years in the legislature. Um, it's been an honor to serve. I'm glad I've been there, uh, you know, fighting for the people of the state and the district. Um, but, uh, you know, you see how the sausage is made and it makes you want to be a vegetarian a little bit, right? It does not look good at all for the majority party to have how many different speakers who've been railroaded out for any number of, you know, CoinGate and uh, ECOT and now House Bill 6 and that whole uh, debacle and the, the corruption and the, the hunger for power, if that's what it is, just is out of control. I'm concerned that, you know, in many areas of Ohio, if the balance of people who vote Democratic or vote Republican is 55-45, and yet 
two-thirds of the House seats and more than that in the Senate are held by the Republicans, then, then there are hundreds of people, thousands, who are not being represented appropriately by their state representatives. In a House floor speech before the vote, Householder said he was innocent of the charges against him and that he would be acquitted of all accusations. After he was expelled, he told reporters that the House went about it the wrong way. The process that the people of Ohio have given in order to remove a member is pretty clear, and that's impeachment. And I even said on the House floor, if, if we're going to have an impeachment, <clears throat> I'll support that. But I don't support doing this the wrong way. And uh, we basically stood out there and they've, they've taken away the vote of the 72nd House District and disenfranchised voters who, even knowing uh, the situation at hand, made a decision to elect me last November, a, a House that certified my election and swore me in in January of, of this year. Uh, and judged me at that time to be fit to serve. And now, you know, here we are a few months later, five months later, I guess, and uh, we've, got a, we've got an expulsion. Democrats can't do it alone. We need Republicans to find a courage to stand with us to make these changes. And also constitutional maps uh, really matter. And so when we think about redistricting, uh, when you have fair districts in which people are able to um, vote for their elected officials and not the other way around, it ensures that elected officials are less likely to, to curry favor with special interests and instead make sure our state government works for everyone. I ran in 2019 and 2018 in the 2018 election against a candidate. He and I were both first time candidates, but he was strongly supported by Mr. Householders and Mr. Householders money and funding. And I was just a first time candidate who was trying to get into the House <clears throat> to give back in a bigger way and to help people. I was able to win that election, but it was not because there was not a lot of money being tossed into into my race uh, by Mr. Householder in his in his bid to uh, get as many people elected to support him, both for speaker and for his policies as he could. And that's, of course, what he used the HB6 money for. Generation Now was indicted along with Householder and officials for the group pleaded guilty in February of 2021, admitting that the purpose of Generation Now was to take in undisclosed donations from First Energy and its affiliates to benefit Householder. Householder's political staffer Jeffrey Longstreth and First Energy lobbyist Juan Suspedes both pleaded guilty to federal racketeering charges in October 2020. Longstreth admitted taking part in setting up and managing Generation Now. Suspedes admitted that he orchestrated Generation Now payments. Their charges carry a possible sentence of up to 20 years and fines of up to $250,000, plus potential additional restitution and forfeiture. The judge in the case, U.S. District Court Judge Timothy Black, said he'll wait until the trial is over to sentence Longstreth, Suspedes, and Generation Now executives. As for lobbyist and former Ohio Republican Party Chair Matt Borges, he's accused of transferring more than $1 million of First Energy's payments to Generation Now into his own consulting firm and offering to bribe a person who turned out to be an FBI informant for inside information to help derail a referendum that could have undone the passing of House Bill 6. Borges has insisted that everything he did was legal and that he was targeted because he's a high-profile Republican who was working on a PAC for Joe Biden. Borges will be tried alongside Householder for federal racketeering and conspiracy. No referendum on House Bill 6 ever made it on a ballot, but parts of it were repealed, including the nuclear power plant bailout. This idea even of a bailout, as bad as that is, um, probably wasn't legitimate. Um, so some of us were... Um, I think caught on to this and started referring to it as a handout and realizing that maybe this money wasn't needed at all. I think we're starting to realize, and now it looks to be the case, that these plants never need the money. And so that brings up a question of what was the money for and who was it for? Uh, and so, yeah, I think some of those questions can go to First Energy, but probably also they should go to the um, current owners of the power plants. Today, First Energy no longer owns First Energy Solutions, and the company has become Energy Harbor. Energy Harbor now owns both nuclear power plants that were supposed to be saved by the $1.3 billion bailout, which was repealed from House Bill 6 at the request of Energy Harbor, who said they no longer needed the money. First Energy had been fighting for this bailout for years and years. This this was House Bill 6 was just the final iteration of their efforts to bail out their nuclear plants. 
And First Energy made some really bad bets uh, to keep those open. They had the opportunity earlier uh, to try to start scaling back. And, you know, these these are very old nuclear plants. They were not really meant to be operating still. They'd been trying to get that bailed out since 2014. They'd actually gone to the federal government at one point asking for a bailout. And when that didn't work, they came back to Ohio again and ultimately got House Bill 6 passed. Um, so for them to then later claim they didn't need it is really interesting. The commentary that they didn't need that after all is uh, a little bit suspect given their their very, very aggressive fight to get that funding for years prior to House Bill 6's passage. I'm very curious to see whether or not other members of the Ohio General Assembly will be implicated as the trial unfolds. At this point, I think I would be shocked if there's not other folks that get a little dirty from this. In the Ohio House and Senate combined, 58 Republicans and 12 Democrats voted yes on House Bill 6 when it passed in 2019. We reached out to every member of the Ohio General Assembly who voted yes, asking them to talk with us. The only one of them who agreed to an interview was Representative Bill Seitz. Bill Seitz from House District 30. I've been in the legislature for 22 years, and I was a strong supporter of House Bill 6 and remain so. Why not just start over and put those things that you feel strongly about in a bill that's not tainted by bribery? Uh, well, first of all, I don't know that it's tainted by bribery. I certainly was not involved in any bribery. Uh, and uh, if the bill passed through the Senate and the governor, uh, along with the House, they're not accused of any bribery. So I don't buy your premise. I'm okay. not saying anybody that voted for the bill was bribed. I know Larry Householder has been accused of it, but the last time I checked, uh, in America, you're innocent until proven guilty. When you learned of what First Energy has admitted to, what was your reaction to that? My reaction to that was they were faced with a public relations nightmare and decided to pay a lot of money to buy peace. There was all these allegations that they had been involved in paying bribes. That's not good for your stock market price. And so uh, they decided to uh, cop a plea and pay over $100 million, I forget the amount, uh, to uh, to uh, buy uh, their their piece, that that happens all the time in corporate America. People, these corporations, uh, uh, will settle cases that they don't even think are meritorious just to put it past them. Do you think that they would have any concern about a defamation lawsuit or any kind of? I, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Larry Householder will see his day in court. First, energy officials won't be facing criminal trial because the company admitted the details that we now know about how this happened and agreed to pay a $230 million penalty. But that doesn't mean the story is over for First Energy because what it's done doesn't stop in Ohio. First Energy Corporation owns utilities in five states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and West Virginia. An audit released in 2022 by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission shows that all First Energy utilities across all five states charged customers for payments to other organizations involved in the federal racketeering case against Householder and Borges. Those payments went to outside firms associated with and owned by Cleveland, Ohio business owner Tony George and the former chair of the Public Utility Commission of Ohio, Sam Randazzo. In a statement of facts filed by prosecutors in the case, First Energy admitted that it secretly paid more than $22 million to consulting firms owned by Randazzo. That was between 2010 and early 2019. Text messages show that First Energy executives wanted Randazzo to become the chairman of PUCO, and he did, making him the top regulator of First Energy and other utility companies. Randazzo resigned in 2020 after the FBI raided his home and First Energy admitted paying him a secret $4.3 million payment that influenced his official actions as chairman. Those actions were influenced into giving First Energy favorable regulatory treatment. We reached out to Pupco to ask about its lack of rate reviews for First Energy, the hiring of Sam Randazzo after the millions he'd been paid by the company First Energy, and how Pupco is protecting Ohio consumers. A representative told us, Pupco has four ongoing and pending investigations related to the matter of First Energy and House Bill 6. Those investigations are currently on hold due to a request from the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Ohio. The commission will continue to follow the facts wherever they lead while also not interfering with any other existing investigations, inquiries, or litigation. Randazzo is a defendant in a related civil lawsuit against First Energy filed by Ohio's Attorney General Dave Yost. 
Randazzo hasn't been charged with a crime at this time and continues to say that he's done nothing wrong. Shareholders are supposed to pay for lobbying um, and ratepayers aren't. And of course, no one is supposed to pay for bribes because they're illegal. The federal investigation is ongoing um, and it seems to be increasingly focused on First Energy's payments to influence the former um, chairman of the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio, Sam Randazzo. Um, so it's entirely possible that more individuals will be charged. Other outside firms that First Energy paid, possibly as many as 16, are either owned by or associated with Cleveland, Ohio business owner Tony George. George is referred to as Individual B in court filings by prosecutors in First Energy's criminal case in Ohio. Those documents allege he acted as a go-between for First Energy and indicted former Ohio House Speaker Larry Householder. We reached out to Sam Randazzo and Tony George. Both of them declined our requests for an interview. Tony George previously told Cleveland.com that anything we build First Energy for was proper. George hasn't been charged with a crime at this time in the ongoing federal investigation. Thanks to a Pennsylvania Public Utilities Commission audit report, we know that First Energy has proposed refunds for its customers in each of the five states it operates in. Exactly what First Energy is attributing those refunds to hasn't been made clear. They've been slow to really detail how much money they owe to customers um, in Ohio and other states related to that in refunds. And regulators have been equally slow, unfortunately, to really investigate further. Um, so to me, it seems like a sane and rational approach when a utility company that's admitted to paying tens of millions of dollars in bribes and also admitted to misusing ratepayer money and being involved in some pretty shady accounting tricks internally. Uh, if I were a regulator and I saw that, I would say this requires a deep, deep investigation going through the company's books to ensure that every penny that ratepayers are owed is refunded um, because, of course, your utility bill isn't supposed to fund things like bribes. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, I don't think we've really seen that happen yet. Policymakers should take a hard look at ensuring that any electric product or service that is competitive stays competitive and is not part of the monopoly utility. You know, if this were your kid, that this might have been kind of a last straw moment. Um, and I don't think we're getting real accountability from the state house or the regulators right now for our utilities. As we wait for the full story to come out about who did what and when, when it comes to the bribery scandal tied to House Bill 6, we have to ask the question, corruption aside, is anything about House Bill 6 good energy policy for Ohio? At least one person who voted yes on House Bill 6 stands by it. People need to look at what was actually in House Bill 6. I'm not here to comment on the circumstances that led to its passage. I can tell you that I worked on the substance of the bill and the substance of the bill produced savings for ratepayers and continues to produce savings for ratepayers. And that's a good thing. That's the defense that Householder and Borges are relying on, that they believed House Bill 6 was good energy policy so they don't see how anything they did to make sure it passed could have been illegal not even taking into account the ways they're accused of personally profiting in this case, experts disagree. It doesn't save money and never save customers money. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, just candidly speaking for the public, the utilities wanna have lobbied and spent this much money and bribed public officials if they thought it was gonna result in less revenue from them. I guess, you know, the first word that came to my mind is embarrassing, uh, shameful. Uh, I think we should expect more, ask more of our elected, elected representatives and our regulators. I've never seen a piece of legislation uh, get the full court press that that House Bill 6 received. Uh, so we received, our, our constituents in our district received mailers, you know, as if they were running a full-fledged political campaign, trying to convince people to call their state representative, called me. I remember the mailer said, call Representative Crossman and tell him to have the courage to vote for this bill. And I told the constituent uh, uh, that I spoke with about that, that mailer that they were receiving, I said, I shouldn't have to have courage to vote for a bad bill. It should just be a good bill. Uh, and if it's, if it's a good bill, I'll vote for it. But it wasn't. House Bill 6 is a terrible piece of energy legislation. I think it was actually termed the worst uh, energy bill in the 21st century, and I agree with that. Um, you know, at a time when other states are increasing their commitment to renewables and energy and shifting toward uh, more stable uh, sources of energy for climate reasons and for economic reasons, frankly. 
um, Ohio went in the other direction. And, you know, this piece of legislation was ironically titled uh, the Clean Air Program at first. Um, but essentially, this had several different components. Um, the first energy, what I call the first energy goodies. Um, this was the bailout for the nuclear plants, along with um, decoupling. And I put decoupling in quotes, too, because it's not typically what you think of when you think of decoupling uh, that was passed. Decoupling was also eventually repealed from House Bill 6. It's actually a popular idea in the energy world, but not the way First Energy was trying to do it. What First Energy received was like a distorted decoupling. And essentially it, it was like rigging the dice. It was like it, First Energy was had a pair of dice, they'd roll 12 every time. They were tagging their electric sales to a peak year. Um, and then also layering on an additional charge uh, to customers for basically charging customers for energy they didn't use. That gave a windfall to First Energy. Uh, in addition to that, it passed a bailout for two coal plants um, for the other utilities in the state, and one of those coal plants isn't even located in the state of Ohio. Um, and then in addition to that, it repealed our clean energy standards, and we were the first state in the country to have repealed those. And when those were passed originally, um, it was a bipartisan piece of legislation with one no vote. Um, so we went really hard uh, in the wrong direction, in my opinion, on uh, the environmental perspective. I don't see any part of House Bill 6 um, that I would call good energy policy. Uh, I would say the, the majority of it was pretty poor energy policy. Uh, and then I think, uh, you know, any provision that, I, that wasn't part of the corruption that got hung on um, did not make the policy better. We should have had an honest conversation about what good energy policy in the state looked like. Uh, that was totally divorced from a scandal-ridden piece of legislation like House Bill 6. Ohio Governor Mike DeWine initially continued to support House Bill 6, resisting calls to completely repeal it even after householders' arrest on federal racketeering charges. A few days later, DeWine changed his mind and called for its full repeal during a COVID-19 press conference on July 23, 2020, exactly one year after he signed it into law. While the policy, in my opinion, is good, uh, the process by which it was created uh, stinks. That's terrible. Uh, I asked the legislature to repeal uh, and replace House Bill 6 through a process, an open process that the public can have full confidence in. And yet, while the bailout and decoupling were repealed from House Bill 6, the rest of it is still law in Ohio. Governor DeWine declined to be interviewed on camera, but an aide from his office provided the following statement to us by email. Governor DeWine acknowledged that due to the alleged bribery scheme for which Mr. Householder and his co-defendants were indicted, the process by which House Bill 6 was adopted was tainted. He supports the repeal so that the policy could be adopted in an above board manner. The aide also told us by email that the FBI has not questioned Governor DeWine regarding Larry Householder and no prosecutors have subpoenaed him for anything related to Larry Householder's racketeering and conspiracy trial or bribery admissions tied to House Bill 6.